Having a plan, a business plan, is not really useful to start up success in my experience. You know, it's a thing that you know gathers dust on your shelf. Plan's not very useful. Planning essential, and I think the business model canvas is a great tool for planning. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101, our business model canvas lecture. Um, before we get going, uh, we just have a few announcements. So stamp cards, we stop stamping cards at 6.15. The ladies who do registration do have to go home at some point. Uh, so at 6.15, no one will be there. So if you haven't had your card stamped yet, please do so. Uh, shout out and a hi to our partners at Norcat, Innovation Factory, and Haltech. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Before I introduce our speaker, Mark Zimmerman, who is our CIO here at Mars, we just want to go back through the Upstart competition. Last week we had a bit of a disruption, so some of our participants are, uh, weren't able to hear it as clearly as we'd like. So um, this is the culminating event of Entrepreneurship 101 for those of you who have been with us uh, here for a couple of years. And we do have flyers and info sheets at the door. So on your way out, you can pick one up just to get some more information, the details, the links, that kind of thing. So it's a business pitch competition open to all our participants. And so for anyone who attends Entrepreneurship 101, you need to have done 60% or 20 out of 30 of our lectures in order to, to be eligible. And it's for 10, we whittle it down to about 10 teams or 10 individuals at the end of the, by the time we, we've done going through all the applications. And what we're really expecting, what we're really expecting is that participants will apply the concepts that they've learned from Entrepreneurship 101. And will, uh, it's for a business that you've either implemented already or that you wish to start. The cash prize is $15,000, but it's actually a prize package that consists not just of the $15,000 cash prize, but we do have some products and services included that will, we believe will greatly benefit um, any upstart, early stage startup. So in order to be eligible, Entrants must have enrolled again in at least 20, have done at least 20 of our 30 Entrepreneurship 101 courses, either live, in person, or by webcast. They must fall into one of our three business practices here at Mars, information technology, communications, and, and entertainment, clean tech, physical sciences, and advanced materials, or life sciences and healthcare. And of course, if social innovation falls into, into your business as well as a sort of an addition, then that's even better. Entrants must have received no more than $100,000 in investment money and earned no more than $100,000 in cumulative revenue. And the reason for that is it's to create a more level playing field for all our participants. And the other, right, the other eligibility point is you must be able to present in person. We did have, uh, I think we had one year when one participant uh, did it by Skype or had recorded it before, and of course, that can cause a bit of problems. Yeah, I have a, I have a yes here at the front. Uh, so there are four stages to the competition process. The first is the Entrepreneur's Toolkit Workshop, which gives, which gives our entrepreneurs, all our participants, a really great opportunity to, to hone their pitch and really sharpen their business ideas. And what we've seen is that it's what happens, the, the businesses come in at the beginning, sort of the front end of the competition process, and they're very different by the time they come out at the, the, on, on the, the last day, on the competition date. So. We have those running December 18th, January 8th, January 15th, and the 22nd, and that covers launching customer, customer discovery, crafting your value proposition, um, designing your business model, and perfecting your pitch. And of course, the application deadline is December 4th, so that's not much time, but the application isn't terribly long, which is a good thing. Competition entry, a uh, three-page executive summary is due by January 31st, and that's the entrepreneurship101 at marsdd.com. Uh, you can also send any inquiries you have about the competition to that, to that email address. Uh, the select entrants will interview with Mars Advisory Services Advisor, and again, we whittle it down to about 10 out of 
Last time I think we had between 50 and 75 applications. We're hoping for a lot more this year because we've had uh, a pretty large group. The third stage is the pitch preparation with the Mars advisor again. Um, and you'll see, if you look at the video that's on our website for the Upstart competition, the, we do have uh, past uh, winners who speak to just how beneficial the, the advisory process is. And of course, the most exciting day, the pitch competition itself, which is the 14th of May. And each participant gives, spends 10 minutes with their pitch, five minutes of Q&A, and then the prize is awarded at the end. And of course, even if you're not participating as a competition entrant, it's still really beneficial, just you know, the networking value is really there. Uh, the criteria for judging. So we do want you to be able to clearly articulate the value proposition, of course, and to demonstrate that there is a market opportunity as well as that the business is sustainable and the business model is sustainable and to demonstrate the competitive differentiation of the business. Um, and of course, just be convincing, make sure that your, your presentation is overall very effective and you should be able to answer the question, would you invest in your own business? I'm sure most of you would have a resounding yes, but think about it. All right, so that is, again, the submission deadline is the 31st, and the, for the workshops, it's December 4th, and that is to entrepreneurship101 at marsdd.com. So that's the Upstart competition. Um, to introduce our speaker, Mark Zimmerman, very quickly, so we can hear from him. I've heard great things about his presentation last year, so I'm looking forward to it. Mark has been working in the information and communication technology industry for more than 15 years. He's worked with some of the biggest companies in the industry, but he's also worked with very early stage startups. So he knows what it's like to be in entrepreneur's shoes. Mark uses his experience to help Mars clients in the areas of B2B, enterprise software, and SaaS business models, as well as security and privacy. I'm going to hand over to Mark now. Please join me in welcoming him. Good evening. Um, I was thinking back to uh, a year ago, roughly, when I was up doing this same presentation uh, this morning as I was getting, you know, getting warmed up and, and thinking about what I was going to, to, to say to you folks. And I think the first thing that I, that I want to call out is just how excited I am at the growth of this program. I mean, I think there were uh, half as many of you here last year. Um, I hope I, you know, um, uh, so I see some people who were here last year. I hope I, I do uh, the topic justice, but uh, I'm certainly just really excited to see the incredible growth of, of, of this, uh, you know, of this, this whole program. Um, and I also reflected back on when I first saw this tool, the tool that I'm going to introduce to you, um, the business model canvas. Um, I, I saw it before it was a book. It was a thesis. Um, it started as an academic um, thesis, and uh, I, I, someone sent me a, a PDF saying, you know, you got to read this thing. Um, it's going to change how you think about um, startups and business models and, and so on, and uh, it really has. And I, I was trying to pinpoint the date for that, so I went back in my, I'm an IT guy, I have all the emails back from the dawn of time, and I went searching through uh, uh, Gmail to find the uh, email. It was, it was the middle of 2009 when that happened. And so, you know, in, in internet time, that's forever, but in sort of in the, the, the change that has been wrought with this tool in how we think about business models and about startups in you know, a relatively short time in sort of four years, I think is, is really quite impressive. And I hope I'll do the, the subject justice, but uh, it's, it's a tool that uh, I think is, uh, is really very valuable and uh, hopefully I will uh, um, explain it to you well. Um, uh, just back in the in the 90s when I started, it said 15 years on my bio. I think I need to update. It's probably 20 years now that I've been in the in the technology space. But uh, um, you know the the business plan that you wrote in the mid 90s to to go get money from uh, venture capital industry in the valley was this giant document that you wrote. Everything was a guess. It was a wild guess times an assumption times another wild guess, um, and you know it had. This, this hockey stick curve in it. Um, and you've probably all seen them, and you know, there's a, a little point in a business model uh, 
uh, curve where it says, you know, the miracle happens there, right at the elbow of the curve. And no one actually knows um, in the planning stage what it is that's going to cause that, but we have them in all of our plans. And in the Dilbert case, sort of making fun of this, uh, you know, that, that miracle happens here is where the armored car crashes through the wall and deposits a boatload of money on our, on our company. That's where the elbow of the curve is. So this is not what I'm going to talk to you about. This is sort of, this is, um, Entrepreneurship theater, you know, sort of a success theater that people get up and talk about. Hey, you know, you're, um, if you plan this way, you know, this good thing will happen to you. That isn't how this typically unfolds in the in the world. And hopefully, um, have we done the lived it lectures? Have you seen some of those so far? I mean, hopefully, those folks were honest and uh, forthcoming uh, with you about, you know, this is part part sort of perseverance part luck about being in the right place at the right time, and part being smart and adaptable when, the, you know, when those opportunities present itself. And I'm going to talk about those, some tools to be smart and adaptable today. Um, because that is your sole advantage as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, the people that you are competing against, uh, the big company that, you know, whose lunch you are trying to eat with your startup has more resources, more brains in it per, you know, uh, more IQ points per, per capita, kind of more money, more product, better marketing, you know, sort of has everything going for it other than nimbleness, right? The sole advantage you have as a startup is that you don't have any of those things, that you don't have those barriers to change, that you can go through this cycle of, I got an idea, I put it in the market, I test whether it works, I take the feedback and I adapt and I go through that loop faster than the other guy. Um, that's the, the, the way to success. Um, another thing I'm not gonna talk to you about is a business plan. Um, how many of you have written a traditional business plan before? Um, so that one there is probably a particularly epic one. I also, in preparation for this lecture, looked up the longest one I ever wrote. I wrote a business plan for a real estate startup, kind of take the MLS data, the real estate data, uh, uh, free it from the real estate agents, put it in the world, and, and so on. It was 192 pages, if you include all of the, the financial models and all of the, you know, the, the things behind it. Um, that is a document that you for sure write once. If you ever finish, you, you, know, you finish it one time, right? You don't, you don't dust it off, you don't look at it again. It's, it's by its very nature resistant to change, right? Um, and so don't do that. Please don't write a business, uh, business plan um, until you absolutely have to, until someone makes you. Then write one. Um, if a banker says, the only way I'm going to give you a loan for your business is if you turn this into a traditional business plan, then do it. Um, but don't do it until then. Um, and I'm going to explain why in, in just a second. But the first reason is because you're not going to change it. Once you make that spreadsheet that you know, calculates all of those things and figures out all of these things and you think, I've got it figured out, as the facts change, as you sort of put your business in the world and it collides with, you know, I guessed that my take rate was going to be 3% and it turned out to be 4%, People don't go back and change those things. You're not going to go rewrite all the pros, right? You're not going to rewrite all of those words and, and so on. And so it's a one-time exercise, and your startup is a journey. And so we want you to have tools that are, are, that are for journeys, and this, I think, is, 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 is one of those. And this is it. It's a nine boxes on a single piece of paper. And to me, it has four really important advantages over the traditional business plan. Um, 192 pages take a long time to write. Um, this, on the other hand, is fast, right? You know, one page is very fast to fill out. Um, um, it's also concise. Um, even if you put it in six-point type and you, you, know, you squish in the most information you can contain in one of those boxes, you've got 400 words in a box, right? You know, you can't write more than that in this box in a useful way. So you have to be concise, and concise, concision is, I think, really important in, in the early stages in particular of a startup, but I think it's valuable you know, throughout that startup, startup journey. The third thing it is, is it's shareable. Um, the other thing with a 192-page kind of business plan is that even if you read the whole thing and you convince your spouse to read the whole thing and you maybe get your co-founder to read the first half, 
right? Um, uh, nobody else is ever going to read it. You know, the VC guy who asks you for it, I promise she will only read the executive summary and the last slide where it says the valuation of the company, right? Nobody reads the middle bits. Um, and so this is, is shareable in a sense of both that they're going to read it, and if you've done it well, it conveys all of the key messages of this business, right? It conveys all of them. And then the last thing is it's changeable. Um, um, I'm going to show you when we go through here, and I'm going to reference at the end, some folks who have software packages, sort of websites for doing business model canvases and so on. The way I like to do it best is to print this thing on a big sheet of paper and stick post-it notes on it. Um, and when you stick post-it notes on it, when you change your mind or you think, hey, what happens if I do this, you're, you're, you have no real res or no significant resistance to tinkering. And tinkering is good at this stage of, of, a, of a startup. When you're in the early stages of figuring out your business model, um, being able to tinker and to try things and so on, I think, is, is, is really important. So that's what uh, um, I'm going to talk to you about is those nine boxes. Uh, so there they are, a little larger. Um, and I'm going to walk you through each one in turn, um, talk a little bit about what goes in it. Um, Important to note, I'm going to go through these in a particular order. I'm going to start with one box and you know, talk about it. Um, there is no one true path through this document. Um, lots of entrepreneurs arrive and they say, you know what, the thing that I have is I have a particular um, knowledge of a market. You know, I know this segment better than anybody else in the, in, in the world. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm intimate with, um, with this particular user population, and then they go looking for a value proposition to fit them. That's the way I'm going to walk through it. But lots of people also arrive with, hey, I've got a product idea. Um, I've got this great mousetrap, but I'm not sure who it's for yet. And that's an equally valid answer you know, in terms of the path through this process. It's also a valid um, advantage, not so much for a startup generally, but the tool is useful for larger companies and so on to say, what existing key resources do I have? You know, my existing business model is not working any longer, or the market is changing around me. How do I take the resources that I have and apply them to new problems? So you can start in any one of these boxes and go to the others. I'm going to go through in a way that I think makes the most sense for introducing the tool, but it's not by any means meant to be prescriptive that you start here and, and go through. So uh, without, with that uh, caveat, let me walk you through the, the first box. So the first box I'm going to show you is the customer segments. And this is about who is your product for? Who do you serve? Um, and this, you can fill this in a couple of ways. You can fill this in with sort of demography. You know, you can say, hey, my product audience is uh, uh, 15 to 18 year old uh, 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 young teenagers. Um, they're uh, you know, they're, they're affluent, they are um, just about to go off to, to university. You know, you can sort of describe uh, the, the, the archetype of who your, who your customer is. You can also describe here, um, you know, the, the particular, um, a particular example. Also useful sometimes to put a persona here to describe, you know, Julie is my customer and she's this. And you know, there's a couple of three Julies who you might describe who cover our representative samples of your market. But we want to talk here about who this product or this business is for. Um, so who do you serve? Second thing that we want to fill in in this, in, the, in this process, the second box that I'm going to talk about, is the value proposition. And this is about what problem do you solve for these people? Um, this is not about, we are all, at least every entrepreneur that I, that I have worked with is enamored of her product, right? You know, it's the solution that I've come up with. It's beautiful, it's perfect, it, it, uh, it has every, uh, it answers every feature. I've invented a better mousetrap. This is not what we want in that box. We want in this box what that better mousetrap does for the customer segment. Right? So we want to put in here, not that I have a better mousetrap, we want to put in here that my value proposition is dead mice. Right? It's not the better mousetrap, it's the, it's the outcome that the, the end user gets from, from that process. Another way to think about that, a um, guy named Clayton Christensen, who I encourage you, if you don't know Clayton Christensen's work, um, go find it. Um, there's a video that he, uh, that'll get you started that I think you'll really enjoy um, that he has about what job people hire a milkshake to do. Um, 
And uh, if you haven't seen it, really worth uh, 10 minutes of your time that I would encourage you to, to spend on Google sort of finding it and then watching it. And uh, he describes the process by, um, by, by which he discovered what commuters hire milkshakes for. And it's not what you think. Um, this is what job does your product do for that customer. The next thing in, in sort of connecting those two things is you have a customer segment, you have an offer for them. What are the channels by which those two things become connected? Right? And uh, um, I think you guys have pr talked about distribution, if I remember where you are in the, in the E101 sort of series. And you know, the, the channels are a key part of your distribution strategy. Right? This is about how do you get that value proposition in the hands of those customers so that they can give you money for it, ultimately. Um, but it's not just about the delivery of the product. It's about first about what channel are you going to use for awareness of the product? How are they going to find out that this value proposition is on offer to them in the first place? And then the, the next thing is how do they buy it or how do they acquire it, depending on you know, whether it's a, a service that you're monetizing in, in some other way. Um, and how do you deliver that product if those are separate? You know, if you're not selling bits, you may have a, you buy it on Amazon, but you deliver it with UPS. And all of those things go in your channel bucket to say, well, here are the channels of how I reach my customer. Um, next box we're going to talk about is the relationship that you have with those customers. Um, and this is also one, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to sound like I'm, I'm a broken record a little bit, but you need to write this not from the, the point of view of what relationship you want to have with the customer. This is from the point of view of what relation does the customer want to have with you. Um, and you know, I, I see often you know, people write in this box, I'm, I'm looking for the customer to be delighted or you know, to love my product. And um, there are. There are classes of product where that's true. You know, people love their iPods or their iPads. You know, we're, we, we, we love them. Um, I don't want to have a love relationship with my dry cleaner, right? You know, like the, you know, it's not a product that I'm going to be enamored of. What I'm looking for there is a low friction, you know, kind of get in, get out. I'm looking for efficiency is the kind of relationship that I'm trying to have, right? It's, you know, it's, it's a transactional relationship. So this is the type of relationship that the customer wants with you, not the, you know, hey, we aspire to be the most loved dry cleaner in the, in, the, in the market space. So what type of relationships do you have with those customer segments? And another, another thing to point out here, um, generally with a, with a startup in its early stages, when you're at the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey, how many of you are working on a startup idea actively in some, in some way? Awesome. Um, so you know, when, before you've found what we call in jargon sort of product market fit, um, you know, before you've sort of, it started to click that model in the, in, in the market, you, you only generally want one of these at a time. Right? You, know, you want to test one of these combinations, see whether it works, and then change a variable. You know, test one of these combinations, see whether it works, change a variable. As your business evolves, you're, it's, it's totally fair game to have four different customer segments and have somewhat different relationships with all of them. Right? You know, to say, hey, uh, my software product, I make, a, I don't know, I make security software. And uh, um, for my, enter, you know, my Fortune 500 companies, um, I have a trusted vendor relationship. They pay me $100,000 a year. I got a sales team who you know, is all over uh, you know, every problem that company has. And we are trusted partners. And then I have the same essential product, but I've, I've you know, packaged it. I've simplified it. And I sell it for $9.99 to consumers. Um, and it's you know, the same uh, antivirus software, let's say. Um, and, uh, um, with them, I have a very transactional relationship. You know, it's hey, they're buying peace of mind. They give me their credit card numbers, and we, you know, we send them software updates, but we never talk. There's no direct connection. You know, it's not a, it's not a, a deep relationship, and that's that's fair when you are, you know, sort of optimizing a business model. But when you're in the beginning of this stage and you're just trying to figure out, you know, is there a there there? Um, you want one of these at a time. You want to do this in series, not in parallel if, you're, if you've got an engineering kind of, kind of mindset. Um, so what type of relationship do you have? And then, of course, in all startups, um, in all businesses, um, you know, the, the test of that relationship is will they pay you money? Um, and so your revenue box goes on the, on the right side of, of this. Um, any of you have advertising-supported businesses or you know, sort of media-driven businesses that you're, you're thinking about? 
Okay, so when you have a double side, a two-sided business model, does that term make, make sense to, to those of you who are in that space? Okay, so where the, the customer or the user and the customer are different people. You know, so take, uh, you know, an online property. I don't know, in the news uh, uh, yesterday, you know, the Rogers guys acquired the rights to, to hockey and uh, the, the user is you and me watching Hockey Night in Canada, but the customer in that sense is Coke, you know, advertising on Hockey Night in Canada, right? They're the revenue stream, so they're one side of a two-sided business model, and you, the user, your attention is the thing being sold to those people. And so when you do that in a two-sided business model on this, uh, on this plan, do one version of the canvas in one color, say if you're doing it my way in post-it notes, do the user's value proposition in blue and do the customer's value proposition in yellow. And you know, they're, they're two and they're interrelated, but they're different. You have a different relationship with each of those people and, that, and that's fine. And you can, um, I've seen three-sided business models. You can, you know, you can sort of take this to uh, you know, sort of as, as, as far as you like, but that sort of uh, media example often gets asked. And I think of the customer as the person who gives you money and the user as the, you know, as, as, as perhaps the, the other part of that, but pick terms that work for you. Um, but you put in your revenue streams. Um, so how do you get paid? And we want in here both the, the unit, the sort of the denominator of that payment, and the, you know, some, some idea of the scale here of the payment. So, um, you know, we want, we get paid per seat in that software model, you know, or per PC protected, say, in the, in the antivirus model. That needs to be on here, you know, sort of the how of your revenue model. And also, you know, your best approximation of the price. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, it's $29 uh, uh, the, the user a month that we're going to charge for our, um, for our software. And I get, I get this question a lot in, in advisory work at, at Mars about, well, you know, my product's not ready. I don't know, I, I'm not sure what to charge for it. I don't know the answer to, to that question. And I say, yeah, so you don't know the answer to any of these boxes, really. And you're, they're all hypotheses at this stage of a, of a startup's um, life. So don't cop out of filling in that box. You know, you're going to be wrong about much of the content that you put in these boxes, but put something in there. Put a stake in the ground that says, you know, I think I'm going to charge $15 a user a month for my middle case product and, you know, um, I don't have any way to validate that yet, but my best guess is that and, and fill it in. So how do you get paid? Um, then, so on the right-hand side, those are all the customer product sort of value proposition parts of this um, equation. And on the left are the hows. Um, so we start with the key activities. What things do you do, all right? And it's not just what things do you do, it's only the things that you must do that fill in this box. Um, I, I see often people fill these in and they say, well, you know, we gotta, we gotta do bookkeeping, we gotta, we gotta do payroll, we gotta do all these sort of business housekeeping things. Yes, you do, they're, they're not optional, you gotta pay taxes, you gotta do all the things that, you know, are the scaffolding of the business, but that's not what's meant to go in this box. What's meant to go in this box are the key activities, um, the unique activities that power your particular business model. You know, taking that antivirus software kind of example, I'm not sure why I have that on the, on the brain today, but uh, if you take that example, one of the key activities is keeping up to date with security threats. You know, you need to know what the bad guys are doing if you're gonna make software that prevents them. So keeping track of uh, malware and viruses and so on goes in key activities if you're an antivirus company. Um, processing credit cards for the payments doesn't. Right? It's not, it's not, it's important, it, you know, it makes, keeps the lights on, it's important to the business, but it's not differentiating. Um, so only the things that you must do yourself, you know, that your company must do in-house, if you will, um, should go in that key activities box. Next one is the key resources. And the easiest way for me to think about these are the first things you put in there are the resources you need to do the key activities, right? You know, so what do I need if I'm gonna keep track of all the bad guys in that antivirus example? I need some smart security researchers. I need a bunch of PhD level hackers who are gonna work for me and find out you know, what's going on and keep track of threats and, and, and so on. They're key resources. So what resources do I need to deliver the, the key activities? Um, those are, you know, the things that go in there. Again, small box designed to have just the most salient um, pieces um, in, that, uh, in that space. 
And then key partners. Who else do you need to make this work? Um, you know, most business models um, have external suppliers, external partners, external um, things, things that are outside of your company that are necessary conditions for success. Um, and you want to write down what those are. And by the same criteria, though, these are not all of our partners, you know. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, in the, uh, I'm, making, I'm making phones now, I'm, you know, making iPhones, and uh, um, the retailers are on my key partner list. You know, I got to be on the shelf at the carriers. That, that, that works. I must have them. Uh, Flextronics and, you know, the people who make the devices, they go in my key partner's box. But UPS probably doesn't, you know what I mean? I need them to, to ship the things. It's important, but it's not essential to my business model. Um, so just the, the really important ones go in there. And of course, all of those activities, resources, and partners cost money. Um, so for those big blocks, we want to write down the cost elements and the cost levers. The same idea as we have with the revenue streams. If, you know, if sort of the denominator of my business is seats, you know, um, I don't know, I'm running a theater. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing lectures and we charge you each $25 a, 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 you know, a session to be here. Um, you know, those costs are driven per chair. The cost structure on the right should be oriented so that it's driven by chair. Right? You know, if that's the, the way it is, we want to define it in sort of the same denomination as the, the revenue streams. Because what we want to be able to do is this, is to take this whole page and say on the right, who are we serving? What are we doing for them? How are we doing it? And ultimately, why are we doing it, right? The why of the business, um, at least if you're uh, uh, hoping to make money at this topic, and I, I hope you are, is the, you know, subtracting the revenue streams minus the cost structure is the why we're all here, right? Um, that's the, the motivating function of, uh, uh, of this business. So it, this, this page, if properly filled out, answers those four very key questions um, that I think you have to be able to answer certainly for yourself if you know before you uh, kind of jump in with both feet on an entrepreneurial journey and you know sort of um, decide that this is what I'm going to do for the next three five seven years of you know of my life building this this business you better have answers that you're very comfortable with to those questions not 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 certainty about any one of those boxes but uh, uh, a gut level comfort that you have, um, you know, sufficient understanding of each of those boxes to to make this leap of faith that is 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 starting a starting starting a business. And particularly, you need even better answers as you go forward when you start asking other people to make that leap, right? You know, when you to say, okay, you know, it's one thing to say I'm going to quit my job and start this company. Next thing, you know, I ask my brother-in-law to quit his job and start and, and join this company. I I ask you know somebody else to write me a check for this. The sort of level of certainty around each of those answers goes up as the pool of people that you're asking to to, to jump gets sort of farther away from you, right? So that's, uh, that's the who, what, how, and why for me of, uh, of, of a startup um, journey. Any of you working on a social venture, a B Corp, or anything of, of that nature? Um, so after the original sort of version of this canvas, we, we made some amendments and some, some tweaks and twists to this and added the social and environmental costs to that same um, equation. So you get to 11 boxes, um, you know, if you, if you add these two in. But if you're if you're looking at your business as a double bottom line or a triple bottom line um, kind of company, really works very well to overlay another set of boxes on here that take the social and environmental benefits of the things that you're doing and subtract the social and environmental costs. And again, you should wind up, uh, you know, um, at least have a clear path to that being a net positive. I mean, it's cool that at the beginning of your business that revenue minus those costs is, you know, is a, is a divot. Um, but you want to make sure that you can uh, uh, see a path to, to coming out the other side of that, uh, of that trough. So that's the tool. Um, it's a very simple, I think, um, tool. There are lots of things online, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of tools on the MarsDB website about it. Um, there's a fantastic book that uh, Alexander Osterwalder, who, uh, is, whose thesis paper this was, um, uh, 
wrote in it, actually the, the process by, by which he wrote it is also fascinating. He charged a bunch of people $24 um, to help him write it and they got a free copy of the book. Um, and uh, sort of in the Kickstarter uh, uh, mode of, of operation, but predating that, uh, that kind of model. And there was a Ning group, which really does date the technology by which uh, you know, people contributed and uh, so on. And uh, there's a whole long list of names in the, in the front who uh, all paid kind of $24 for the book sight unseen, kind of, and for the, the privilege of participating in its, its creation. Um, but it's a fantastic book, um, and there's lots of videos, so on and so forth. But I think the best way to um, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, sort of cement this model in your mind is to take a, take a look at a, at, a, at, a, at a business, at a startup, um, through this lens. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a case study of a, of a startup that I, um, I, I'm kind of fascinated by. I'm a coffee drinker. Um, and uh, um, Oh, sorry, I'm not actually going to walk you through that yet. I'm going to got two more slides that I added to this deck since I last talked about this. Um, let me rewind for a second. So another thing about this tool is you can look at it through different lenses. I mentioned that you can share it with people you know, as one of its four benefits, that you can share the canvas with other people. Um, here's the view from a founder's point of view in my experience. They're all about the value proposition, right? Every entrepreneur is in love with her value proposition. Um, and so that's the founder view of the canvas. It's all about that one box. You know, if they could just fill in the one box, they'd be happy. Um, no way to make a business there. Your business, your product is the whole page. Um, you know, if your product is your startup rather than the thing that your startup makes, then this whole thing is your product. But that's the founder view. The customer view looks like this, right? A customer looks at, this is the benefit for me. Um, a lot of people get identity or identify with the products they buy, and so their identity is bound up in the customer segment that they're part of in their relationship with that brand. And of course, the price is part of the revenue stream. So this is the way a customer can, you know, if you were explaining to a potential customer the thing that you're going to build, you know, you cover up the left side of the, of the, of the model, and you only talk to her about those four boxes on the right. So you can present to a customer from this one page. Um, you can also pitch to an investor from this one page. Uh, um, if any of you are going to, I hope all of you will, enter the upstart competition that uh, uh, we talked about at the beginning. Um, these four things are what investors care about, right? You know, if you're having a, a VC conversation, it's only these four things, and really, it's only traction. You know, it's the one of those four things that it devolves to when you're when you're ultimately done. But they care about how big is the market, you know. So how big is if we win the whole prize? How big is that prize? Or, you know, how big is the is the is the is the whole market? Um, what evidence, the traction? What evidence do I have that you could win? You know, what evidence do I have that you have already begun to win in this um, in this space? Um, can you make any money at it? You know, can you? Can, is there any margin uh, foreseeable in this in this model? And then a little bit about is there any defensibility? Is there any? You know, is there a moat that you can build around this business um, in terms of hey, I've got a set of patents, or I've got those four PhDs and they love me and they're staying with my company. I've got them locked in for the next five years, and you can't have them, and so that's defensible. Um, to you know, to to some extent. So those are the the lenses through which investors look at this same canvas. So um, lots of ways to look at this model. Um, those are a couple, and I, I thought they were they were useful. Um, so I mentioned I was going to give you a particular example. I gave away the the I gave you a clue here about what those are. Anyone know what those are? They're Nespresso capsules. Um, and uh, I go through two or three of them a day at least, and uh, maybe it's why I'm talking so fast. But uh, um, anyway, I'm a, I'm a big coffee um, drinker. And uh, when this thing, when this product was launched, um, it was invented in 1970. Um, in 1976, the patents were issued around the Nespresso idea. Um, it took them a while. It was, you know, uh, not exactly a, a fast-moving um, venture. Um, it took them ten years to go from we got a patent to we have a product um, in the in the market, um, and they went out to restaurants. And the value proposition was this: you know, that training your waiter, waitress, uh, uh, you know, the chef to make a good cup of coffee is hard. Um, they're not in, you know, they're, this is 1986, they're not a barista on every corner. Not everybody had worked at Starbucks at some point. There wasn't a whole population of people who knew how to do this. Training them how to make a good espresso is difficult. It's also slow. 
you know, and, uh, and it's uneven, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy's going to get it, Julie's going to make a bad one, and, you know, your customer at the end of the day is just getting her check from, you know, from buying a meal with you, and this is the final part of your value proposition restaurant, this coffee that's being served, and if it's bad, then everything else that went before it looks bad too. Right, so as a value proposition, it makes a ton of intuitive sense to me. You know, like when I say it there, I say, yes, I would sign up to this as a restaurant. I'm not in the restaurant business, but if I ran Mercado, say, up on the second floor here, I'd say, yeah, give me two. Um, you know, this is a good, good value proposition. Um, and didn't work. They banged their heads against this for two years. Um, they tried different sales models, different sales plans. They tried it in different geographies. They thought, hey, maybe it's Paris that doesn't work. You know, we're going to pick it up. We're going to try it in Geneva. Um, and they tried all the obvious things and failure, dud. Um, and they sunk a good chunk of money in the 10 years, you know, in developing this product and in figuring this out. And so they didn't come to that conclusion lightly. You know, they said, hey, we don't know how to do this. Um, and so in 1989, uh, a guy named J.P. Gallard was hired as the director of this product. This was not exactly a plum assignment, you know what I mean? They didn't say, all right, we're going to put our superstar guy in charge of this product. It was like, all right, you know, we're not sure what to do with him. We're going to give him the Nespresso thing, and maybe he'll, you know, do something. And he changed this product's trajectory. Um, you know, we now call that in the lean startup kind of world, a pivot. Um, didn't have that term in 1989, but he changed the business model essentially. And here's what he did. He said, on his business model canvas, I'm going to treat this as two products. Um, I'm going to separate the machine, the coffee machine, and the capsules, and I'm going to sell them differently. Right? I'm going to treat them as two parts of the process rather than as a single entity. The old one they sold per cup, you know, kind of you paid 99 cents a, a cup and you got the machine included in that process. He said, no, I'm going to change that. I'm going to separate these two things. Um, he said, we're not in the manufacturing business. We don't know anything about making these machines. We're not very good at it. Um, we're going to let somebody else do it. We're going to hire somebody else to make the machines, to service the machines um, when they break, when they, you know, when they don't work, when they got to figure out where do we get new metal for the things. We're going to let that be somebody else's problem. We're also not going to sell these things. We're not going to go you know, door to door to restaurants with the machine in the bag, sort of set it up at 4 o'clock when the restaurant's kind of slow and you know, show them our, our demo. We're going to stick this thing in retail stores. We're going to put it in high street retailers and see um, if, it, if it works in a, in a retail model. Um, he said, we're also not going to handle the distribution of that stuff. So down on the, you know, on the key activities, said distribution is not one of those key activities. We don't have to do it. Um, we're going to let somebody else do it. Um, we're going to let those manufacturers, we're going to let Philips uh, in, the, you know, in the early days of this stuff, we're going to let them deliver that thing, figure out how to stock them in the shelves at Harrods and you know, keep those shelves full and figure out the logistics of that. And they're going to build the warehouses and they're going to do all that stuff. We're not going to do that stuff. Um, the only thing we're going to do um, that we're going to keep tight to us is we are going to handle the sales training. You know, we, we think we've figured out the right... Um, way to communicate this value proposition to, to sort of to sell it to customers. And so we're going to insist that if you want to carry this thing in your retail store, you have to let us train your, your sales staff, right? This is the bargain. We're going to, you know, we're going to give you our product. We think it's a great product. Um, we're going to pay the stocking fees, the co-op advertising fees. We're going to do all the things that we need to do to get you to carry our product. But we're going to insist that we do sales training. Um, and so they said, yes, we're going to handle the sales training part of this process. They said the capsules, um, we're going to sell them online and over the phone. Um, you're not actually going to be able to buy coffee with your coffee machine. Um, you, you know, you, it, not something that on the surface of it makes a whole lot of sense. You know, part of the value proposition was you buy this machine, you spend $200 for the gadget, um, you take the gadget home, we're going to give you some free coffee, we're going to give you some starter coffee with it, but if you say, no, no, I'd like more, you know, I, I want to, I'm sold already, I think it's a great thing, I want to take 400 coffee pods home with me. They will not let you. Um, not allowed. Um, you can't buy the, the pods in the store because they wanted to change how that relationship works. The customer relationship box was something they thought was important. And they said, we're going to make that customer relationship box a direct relationship between us. So we're going to sell those things. We're going to deliver them to you directly. Um, and as the market matured, as it evolved, they, you know, I said to you, know, sort of when you're in the startup stage of this, you want few variables and you want to test them in series. 
so they, once they got that first part right, they said, okay, we're gonna layer on some other experiments and see if they, if they work, if they achieve what we were hoping. So they layered on, they said, okay, we're gonna make our own machine, we're gonna brand our own machines, we're gonna stick our logo on them. We're still not gonna make them, you know, they're still gonna be made by Philips or by Seiko or by somebody else, but they're gonna carry the Nespresso brand on the gadget. So, okay, we'll do that. Um, they also added their own retail stores. Um, I saw a billboard actually a couple days ago that they've opened a new one in, in Yorkville here in Toronto. Um, you know, they added their own uh, um, retail footprint. They said, not only are we gonna train the salespeople, but they're gonna work for us. You know, they're gonna be our salespeople. Um, so said, hey, we can get even closer to that stuff. And they also went back to the restaurant model. They created something called Nespresso Pro that they went back to. They said, you know, hey, now that we've worked out some of the logistics of this, we think we're gonna take another, another approach at the, the, the restaurant uh, uh, and office market. Um, so it worked out pretty well for them. Um, this, this, this new business model, when they took it to market, had a 30% compound annual growth rate. Um, um, uh, I don't know if any of you are finance people, but that is, people dream about businesses that can do that. There are almost no examples I can think of in the, in the world that have sustained that kind of growth rate for a decade. Um, you know, that's 30% year over year. In the first year, you start up, you know, you zero to 30%, yeah, not too hard. Um, you know, second year, it gets a little harder and you get caught up in what we call the law of large numbers and adding 30% in year 10 is really, really hard. Um, and they've, they've kept on that trajectory, a 30% uh, compound annual growth rate over a decade. Um, $3 billion in annual revenue when I, when I updated this, uh, uh, when I did this slide last year, I, I, I'm sure it's north of that, but I haven't found a, a better uh, uh, a number, uh, but big, big, really big. Um, they sold uh, 12 million of those machines um, so far, um, 20 billion of the capsules, um, and uh, so that's, that, that's worked out pretty well. It's available in 50 countries. Again, it's probably available in more since I, um, you know, since I last did these slides. And so it's been a roaring success. Um, and you know, all, all, all indications are that it's going to continue to be uh, a great success. And so I thought I would try and map its business model for you onto the canvas as a concrete example. I think I've explained, I hope I've explained it to you at least enough um, in, you know, kind of in English, kind of how the business is, and now I'll show you how it works on the, the in the nine boxes. So here we go. Um, so the customer segments, at least at the beginning, were high-end households. You know, this is not the cheapest way to make a cup of coffee. Um, it's, not, it's not outrageously expensive, but it's definitely, a, you know, a luxury item. It's not a, it's not a, not a, so it was targeted at a high-end household. Um, and the value proposition, really simple. You know, it's hard to make good coffee. Same value proposition that we pitched to restaurants, but now pitched it to consumer. You know, we're gonna give you restaurant quality espresso at home, right? And it's gonna be easy and you don't have to clean it up and it's all of those things. But the central value proposition is just that, right? You know, um, you could go buy, a, a, you know, you've always been able to buy one of these machines. You gotta figure out how to tamp the thing just right and, you know, kind of get the water flow just right. And there's, it's work, um, and then the espresso thing is dead simple. You know, you put the cap in, you pull the thing, you boom, out comes uh, out comes perfect coffee. Um, so high end restaurant quality espresso at home. Um, the relationship to me is the key def the key differentiator between this model and the model they had before. Right, the old model was, um, you know, you buy this product, you're you're buying coffee. This this is not a retail relationship that they've established with me. They call me an Espresso member. I have an Espresso membership card. I don't know where to find it, but I do have one. Um, um, you know, and the, the relationship is that, that I'm a member of some you know, semi-exclusive club that they've created that, uh, you know, that that's the nature of the relationship that they've tried to build with those customers and that they've been you know, very successful in building at least with the 12 million machine, you know, the 12 million people who are part of the club. Um, and so member is, is the key word there in terms of the definition of that relationship. Um, what are the channels? Well, initially the channels retail. You know, you make your first encounter with this product in a physical store, in some retail establishment is where you're, you know, you're, you first touch it, you first feel it. Um, and then after that, 
it goes online, it's in a call center, and then we mentioned the extension to their own um, boutiques. All of those are channels by which this, um, you know, this thing is, is delivered. Um, the revenue stream, the hardware, yeah, you know, interesting. They make a few bucks at that. They've, they've sort of managed to make more and more margin as the product has become more, ex more successful. The nature of the relationship between Nespresso and the uh, the manufacturers of the machines has, has changed. You know, it was once, please make this machine for us. I know we've wasted a lot of time on the first version, but it's going to be okay the second time. Um, to now, you know, if you wish the privilege of making our machines, um, you know, your margins are going to be about this big and you're going to like it. Um, you know, so the, the hardware um, process has changed, but it's still a very small revenue stream from the machines relative to the 20 billion capsules, right? You know, I don't have the, the, they don't break out the numbers in a way that I have access to, but if you do some simple math on 20 billion capsules at, let's call them 50 cents a piece um, versus, a, you know, a 12 million machines at $200 where they might make 10% on the machines, you quickly see that, you know, the, the capsules are where the, where, where, where the business is. Um, so capsule sales are the revenue stream. Um, what are the key resources that you need to do this? Um, well, you need distribution. You've got to figure out how to deliver those capsules in a reasonably, reasonably timely fashion, right? You know, because this whole value proposition of being a member breaks if I run out of coffee on Tuesday and you can't get me new coffee until a week from Tuesday, right? Um, you know, one time that happens, I go buy a regular machine and, you know, I learn how to work the, the levers. Um, but as long as you can deliver me coffee the next morning, you know, within sort of 9 a.m. the next day, um, I can keep track of those capsules, you know, or at least I learn my lesson once and then I keep track of the capsules. Uh, and uh, so, you know, but you have to figure out a pretty robust distribution network. And... Ten years ago when they launched this model, that was a lot harder than it is now. This is one of those things that's gotten, it's still not easy, but it's materially easier than it was. You know, there are lots of companies you can now hire to, to do that distribution for you. Um, you need a brand, right? You know, I wasn't going to believe somebody other than Nespresso or a relatively small number of people who could convince the customer at the beginning of the process that they could fulfill that value proposition of, of restaurant quality, right? You know, if Tim Hortons opens, uh, you know, starts selling me, came to me with that value proposition, lots of great things about that brand, but I'm not going to believe you, right? You know, I, I don't, I'm not going to take your word for it at the, at the start of the process. So you needed a brand that could be extended to this, at the, you know, in terms of the process. Um, that moat, the patents around this idea were a great thing at the beginning. And I mean, you've probably seen in your, in your grocery store, there's a whole bunch of now very close to the Nespresso value proposition products. And that's directly related to those patents are no longer a defense in this topic. And so um, we have the Tassimos and the, you know, a whole bunch of other very similar products because that defensibility is no longer um, um, there, but it gave them a long time to, you know, to establish a commanding lead in the space before the, the other guys could follow. So the patents were a great part of the defense. Um, and you need a production plant. You need to be able to make these capsules, right? You know, you got to figure out how to manufacture them and manufacture them in some fairly significant quality quantities and, uh, and so on. Um, the key activities, also fairly straightforward, only three of them in this, in this area. You got to be good at marketing. You got to be good at production. And you got to be good at logistics. You know, if you can do those three things, you can win in this in in this particular market. Um, everything else, uh, and those are pretty big things, but you know, everything else is extraneous to to this to this business model. Um, and you need some key partners. And in this case, you only you, you need you need really two to make this work. You need the people to make the machines for you, because if you're not going to do it, someone's got to do it. You need some machines, and you needed those retailers to sign up at the beginning of the process to say, you know, hey, yes, I will let you train my staff. I will let you go down this, down this, this path. Um, those things have costs. You know, the distribution and sales is a big part of that, particularly at the start of the, the model. The manufacturing and the marketing, um, also continuing long costs or, or long, you know, large parts of the cost model going forward. And if you subtract those things, you wind up with a, a very healthy business in this case. Um, I mentioned, you know, at the beginning, uh, sort of four reasons why I think this, you know, the, 
the canvas is compelling. Um, and this, this, I think, summarizes those really, really nicely. You know, if you do this well, you can do it in pictures. So you can be so concise that you can do it with just a graphic. Right, you know, um, you know. I, I know when I see that picture, I, they offered me a laser pointer. I forgot to say yes because I can point up there in the upper right-hand corner. But you know, that picture conveys to me the ho kind of households we're talking about. I get who they are with that picture on the right. I get that they're members by the, you know, by the physical card. Right, you know, I know what they're aspiring to here is not a transactional relationship. Um, the value proposition is nicely summarized by 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 that. Uh, you know, by, by that picture um, and the same, you know, throughout the, the thing. And so um, if, if you can get to that level of concision in, uh, in, a, in a business model, I think it will serve you really well. Um, you know, it will have done a couple of things. It will have hopefully clarified your thinking sufficiently that, you know, you can, um, you can, when you have a business, another, another problem with a business model, you know, you have, with a business plan, you have a 192 page, you know, back to the start kind of business model, and you come to a strategic fork in the road for your company. You know, you gotta decide, um, I don't know, are we gonna um, take the business to China or not? You know, or is that the next country that we should take our value proposition for? The, the, you don't, there's no, um, you can't scrub that idea against that plan. Right? You, know, you can't sort of say, okay, well, you know, what happens if I put China into the 192 pages and see what happens? Right? You can't do that. This, at this level of, of detail, you can say, okay, what if, what if I go to China? Well, how many of those people are there in the customer segment? Okay, there's you know, three, three, three million people who are in that high-end household who have enough disposable income to do this in, in, in my space. Um, you know, I can find out how many of them drink coffee. I can sort of, I can compare, I can ask questions of this model and hopefully have them uh, answered or, you know, at least give myself a framework um, in which to answer them. So that's the business model of an espresso. Um, if you're interested, I hope I've sparked your curiosity about this, uh, this idea and this concept. Um, I'd encourage you to get business model generation, which is Alec and Eve's uh, uh, book outlining this, this topic. Um, it's not your typical dry business uh, uh, textbook. It's, uh, it's actually really quite fun to read. It's filled with, with great pictures and so on. Um, uh, a, a fellow that I'm, 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 I'm very pleased to know and who uh, I think is one of the smartest thinkers about sort of st the startup um, ecosystem, uh, Ash Moria, um, has a book called Running Lean. Um, which takes these principles and marries them with the lean startup methodology that I think Nathan Monk, a colleague of mine, gave you a little bit of a, a, a taste of a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Ash has kind of combined those concepts in a, in, in a way that I think is, is very interesting. And uh, I'll leave you with um, uh, Churchill who said anything better, everything better than anybody else, but said, you know, plans are of little importance, but planning is essential. And I think that, to me, summarizes why this is a useful tool. You know, having a plan, the business plan, is not really useful to startup success, in my experience. You know, it's a thing that you know, gathers dust on your shelf and does this thing. But the act of thinking through all the questions um, and writing down, you know, sort of you know, crystallizing those, the, that thinking is invaluable to a startup, right? You know, um, having thought through those things is, is huge um, uh, value in terms of uh, increasing your odds of success. So plan's not very useful, planning essential, and I think the business model canvas is a great tool for planning uh, as opposed to documenting kind of atrophied plans. Uh, um, I hope that's been, been helpful and I'm happy to take any um, questions, uh, talk with you about, about, the, about the model and uh, um, hopefully my uh, enthusiasm for it is catching. It's been a, a tool that has helped me uh, immensely in uh, my, my advisory work and startup uh, um, interactions in general. So uh, it's, it's something I'm a huge fan of. Hope it shows. Thank you. Any questions? Please. Oh. Shout or go to the mic, we'll figure. We do have time, Mark, for one official question. Oh. But are you, I'm 
I'm happy Hanging to stick around, around after okay, for great. questions, but I'll take a, an official question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, to, uh, I was comparing uh, this business model that you provided with us with the printers yes. that uh, HP has. Basically, the pods are the printer cartridges. Yes. Uh, the question I have is, where do you stop creating a business model for entrepreneurship? For example, uh, product lifecycle. Right now, like people fill up the HP printers with ink. Yes. But when you want to start a business, that's way beyond into the future. Same with the pods right now. For example, people have the reusable pods. Right. So how do you cut off where you have an initial business model of going forward rather than going second and third generation into your... Well, I, I mean, I think, I think in a mature enterprise, your HP, let's say, you likely have lots of business models. You know, you have business models for, um, you know, the printer business, and you have business model um, that evolves through that area. You know, like when you began as HP, you controlled the, the ink. You know, the ink was a, a, a resource that no one else could, you know, no one had figured out how to inject, you know, into the cartridges, or at least that wasn't a business. You know, there, there wasn't a lot of people who knew how to hack that. Um, I think as those facts change, you need to, Adult, you know, you need to adapt your business model um, or see somebody yeah. else, you know, um, Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. So when you're creating this, where do you stop? It means I don't want to look at my second, third iteration or do I stop? Well, so if you have an existing business, I think you start by documenting where you are now, right? You start by saying, here are my current customer segments, here's my current value proposition, you know, so on. And either you find, hey, this is where I am now and this is working, you know, this is success for me, or you find, you know, this isn't working, and you begin to say, um, what is my hypothesis about which box here is the one that's broken, right? And, you know, and I don't know what that is for your particular business, but you'd say, hey, you know what, I've got the customer segment wrong. You know, my customer segment has changed. They no longer, you know, I don't know, they no longer print things. They've decided they can store it all online, and, you know, their behavior has changed, so how does that change my, my canvas? Or you say, the technology has changed. You know, it used to be, this, the drive was expensive, and so I had to design around that. Now disk drives are cheap, and so you know, how does that change my my canvas? I think you kind of you know you need to document the now and then have a theory. Yeah, that work. Thank you, everyone, for coming. If you have questions for Mark, he'll be he'll be around for a bit. Yeah, please, thank you.